good to see you. Why would we not be friends? Uh, you're lovely people. I, I have to say, uh, every Sunday morning when I come down here quite early and start clearing the latest deposit that um, some drunk person has left on our step, I'm sure you, I know you have a team that does that here as well, but um, the noise that's coming out of this building is fantastic and uh, it really blesses me. I mean, like one day, it just sounded like angels were singing and uh, I think you were off that day, Sam. Yeah. But, eh? <laughs> <laughs> No, absolutely, absolutely brilliant. You guys have the best toilets in any church in Derby. I have to say, every time I go to Louis, I'm so jealous. <laughs> no, but it's fantastic. It's been great to get to know some of your uh, leadership, Phil and Anna, played golf with Phil a couple of times. You can ask him what happened. And, um, but, uh, but lovely people, and it's really good. To, it's an honor to be here this morning. Um, Interestingly, um, my name's Lenton, which is a scruffy end of Nottingham, and uh, even though I'm a Yorkshireman born and bred, uh, my family lineage goes back all over the place, and actually, my great-great-grandma and granddad got married here, which is like a real thrill for me to be, uh, to be preaching today, so uh, fantastic. My other, their, their parents got married in St. Altman's, so... Uh, amazing, the old St. Altman's, obviously, but uh, fantastic. So I'd like you to turn to Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we're going to read a very strange reading. And you might think, do you know what, Andy, let's just skip this, because I usually do, because it's a bit of a boring reading, and like, you know, uh, there's bits in the Bible that are a little bit like, why is that there? Uh, it's just a little bit of a filler, or a little bit boring, but um, actually, it's, um, it's quite fascinating when you, uh, when you get looking at some of the characters in this particular uh, reading. And um, I won't go on for too long, I know you're all rushing home to watch the tennis, who have we got for Djokovic here? Who have we got for Kyrgios? Ooh, some people like the bad boys. Yeah, there you go. So uh, that'll be interesting. But um, yeah, so let's read Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read out of the, the New Living. But I don't know what this is on the screen. It might, be, it might be NIV or something like that. But uh, this is the record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of King David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah. Their mother was Tamar. I want you to remember the mother, Tamar, that lady. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Narshan. Narshan was the father of Salmon. Salmon was an interesting guy. He was the father of Boaz. His mother was Rahab. Remember Rahab this morning. Boaz was the father of Obed, and his mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, and his mother, in many versions says, was Uriah's wife. In the New Living, it says, it actually names her as Bathsheba. It's a very interesting passage of the Bible. And maybe in our culture, it doesn't mean an awful lot. Maybe we skip over it. I know I have many, many times. Thought, Let's get on to the, the proper stuff. You know, I don't, I don't even know who all these people are. So they're all people who I can't pronounce. And, um, and so I skip over it. But actually, there's a lineage there. And just like I've found in my own family history... There's a bit of a connection. There's an interest there uh, with, with, with you guys. You know, there's, a, there's an interesting connection with some of these people that are mentioned in this particular passage, but particularly the women. We're going to look at the women today. You gave me Rahab, and if you know the story of Rahab, boy, is she a woman to be wrestled with. She is a, she is a woman to be wrestled with because she's a prostitute, she's a liar, and she's a pagan. And uh, how can God use anybody like that? You know, and actually, when I'll tell you a little bit more about her a bit later on, but, uh, you know, God seems to be okay with some of that stuff. Seems to be. 
And uh, that's worth wrestling over. How many people here wrestle with scripture? Reading scripture that you wrestle with is good for you. It's really good for you because it makes you study other little passages where that particular person is mentioned. And I would say if you're wrestling with a particular part of scripture at the moment, keep wrestling with it. Keep wrestling with it because the Holy Spirit will speak to you through it. The good bits, the good bits are not bits to be missed out or, or skipped over. I, mean, I want to look at the, the women in this passage and then bring in another woman that's uh, mentioned a little bit later on in that passage, that, a bit of the passage that I haven't read. So let's look at them. Let's look at Tamar. Tamar. Tamar's mentioned in that passage, but actually she's mentioned more in Genesis 38. And it's a very interesting part of the, the Bible is Genesis 38. You couldn't make a soap opera up about Tamar. <laughs> Boy, is she interesting. You know, if, uh, if you saw a movie with the, the life of, of Tamar in it, as good Christians, you would probably turn through the other side. Uh, it was probably not good for me to watch that particular, particular bit. But it's quite tragic. What a life she had. Quite desperate, really. Her first husband died. Very sad. They've not had a child yet or anything like that. So she's a, she's a childless widow. And the tradition of that day was that, uh, well, the next brother takes that wife on. Yeah, I love my sister-in-law. Would I want to be married to her? I don't think she'd want to be married to me, to be quite honest. But that was the tradition of, of that day. And, uh, but he's not particularly interested in fathering a child with her or anything like that. And, uh, and so this actually angers God. And God kills him. So now she's tragically a double widow. And um, she's had two husbands that uh, 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 have died. She's got a reputation for being uh, a lady who finishes off her husbands. And so the tradition then is, well, has, is there another brother who she can marry? Well, the, the next brother is probably far too young. And the father of the house, Judah, he's thinking to himself, well, she's got rid of two. I don't want her to get rid of my other son. So I'm not going to let her have my son. I'm not, I don't want her to get married to my son. He sends her back to her, her father. But it leaves her in a very tragic situation. So what does she do? Tamar dresses out of her widow's clothing into the clothing of a prostitute. And she knows that her father-in-law is going to come a certain way. And she sat there. And uh, he propositions her. And she ends up sleeping with her father-in-law. Like I say, you couldn't make a, a soap opera up about it. He, he gets her pregnant. And she has a son. And the whole story of Tamar is really summed up in one word. And that is really desperate quite desperate you know it's a pretty pretty sad and, and torrid story and yet Tamar is mentioned in the lineage of Jesus she's there wow wow how can God use a person like that but she's there and then we're introduced to the second woman in the passage Rahab like I say, I've really wrestled with, with Rahab in my preparation uh, for this. Whereas Tamar dressed like a prostitute, Rahab was a prostitute. Everywhere that she's mentioned in scripture, it always names her Rahab the prostitute. You know, it's really polite like that. You know, and she's in the New Testament and, uh, you know, she's, she's carried on. She's a prostitute. Rahab the prostitute is mentioned by the book of Hebrews and the book of James. And uh, it's really interesting. In fact, the book of James holds her on a similar level to Abraham, the father of faith. And Rahab the prostitute. And it's just like, wow, this is quite interesting, this, this, this scripture. She's a professional. In Joshua, she's mentioned mostly. Um, actually, we don't read that she has any children. What we do read is that Rahab is a lying pagan prostitute. I mentioned that Salman was uh, an interesting guy. It doesn't actually say it in the Bible, but Jewish tradition says that Salman was one of the spies that Rahab hid on her rooftop. 
And that's really interesting. In fact, it's really interesting at all that spies going into the promised land, the first thing they do is go to a prostitute's house. You know, I mean, that's men for you, isn't it? But uh, maybe there's a method in that. But maybe it was all part of bringing this lady Rahab into a relationship with God. You know, God takes you into some very strange places when you hear the Holy Spirit, doesn't he? When he says, go and talk to that person, you don't know who that person is. The other day I was, um, uh, I was carless and uh, I was working down here and I decided to, to walk home. So uh, I set off and I was uh, heading towards Kettleston Road where I live and uh, I got to five lamps and there was a guy uh, with a walking stick propping up the wall, sort of like shuffling along like that. And uh, I just, I wasn't going to walk straight by him. I've read the Good Samaritan. <laughs> and um, I just stopped and I said, do you need any help, mate? And he was like, oh, no, don't let me hold you up. You're all right. I said, well, I'm not in a rush. It's a nice day. I'm just on my way home. So, you know, I'll, I'll, do you want to grab hold of my arm? And he grabbed hold of my arm. And it took us about an hour to get 100 yards. <laughs> but in that hour... I learned that he was a, he was a script writer to, for TV. He wrote several um, uh, good series that were on ITV and all sorts of things. I got to know his life. And he asked a little bit about my life. He actually knew where my church was and he'd been a couple of times. And it was really interesting. It was a real privilege to, to get to know him. But uh, yeah, we don't... We don't really hear an awful lot about uh, the history of, uh, of Rahab and how many kids she had or anything like that. But she was a liar. She was a liar. We've heard a lot about lying, haven't we, just lately? We've heard a lot about how lying tends to be a little bit of a boomerang that comes back and hits you on the back of the head. And, um, and yet... My father-in-law, when he watches the news, he gets really agitated with Boris. And, uh, you know, it's disgusting, it's disgusting. How can anybody be used by that? And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, God used Rahab. God used Rahab. God uses all. And I said to my father-in-law, have you ever told a lie? And he takes no notice of me. <laughs> and I said to him, because I have. In fact, we all lie, don't we? So Rahab was a liar, she was a prostitute, she was a pagan, she was from a totally different culture, she didn't even have the Ten Commandments to tell her not to lie. So maybe it was okay in her culture, who knows? Don't judge her for it. But you know, God used her. God used her. She had a very dodgy history. But you know what? God uses people with a dodgy history. You know, my friend... I've got a friend who's an Eritrean and um, he's got such a story because he's made that journey all the way from Eritrea right into Libya, inflatable boat across the Mediterranean, into Italy and on into Europe and he was literally clutching onto an axle of a lorry when he arrived in Britain. And uh, he settled in Britain and he's got a job eventually got obviously leave to remain he's got a job and uh, he's making a great contribution now he's a wonderful man but you ask him to talk about his journey in fact he wants to talk about his journey but halfway across the Mediterranean the motor of the boat was stopped deliberately and the guys who were running the boat said right everybody who's not a Muslim get out and he stayed quiet and some people were forced overboard. And some people were questioned about what's your faith. And he was a Christian. And he kept silent. And whenever he tries to tell his testimony, he gets to that point And he breaks down crying. And he just thinks God's, he's let God down. God can't use him anymore. And yet, he's now living in this country. He's got a wonderful wife. He's got lovely kids. He's working, he's making a great contribution and yet that is holding him back all the time because he can't share his story because he feels like he's let God down. Rahab was a lying pagan prostitute. Her life was messy. You know, I don't know about you, I have a very complicated relationship with mess. You know, I'm a pastor 
But actually, when I meet a person who's got a very messy life, everything within me is going, don't get involved. Don't get involved with that. It's just too much. You know, I don't know about you, but I don't know whether that's you or where you are. But I'm like that. You know, and yet, in my own head, I've got a lot of mess going on up there. I've got some really good friends who thankfully have prayed with me over a journey of about 20 years and we've been accountable to each other. They know my mess. They know my struggles. They put up with me. But I struggle with other people's mess and maybe that's, maybe that's, maybe that's you as well. But we know, because the Bible says, it's by grace we are saved. Through faith. It's by grace. God knows our mess but it's by his grace. We could be fantastic people. We could be lovely, generous, gorgeous people. But you still have to come to God's grace. You still have to come under God's grace. You can't work your way to heaven because there you would have a lot of boasting people. Heaven's going to be a very interesting place, isn't it? There's going to be people in heaven who you think, hmm, they're here. How did, how did they get here? And then there'll be other people who are in heaven, uh, who are not in heaven, and you'll think, think about, where's, where's that person? You know, they had the biggest Bible, they knew, they knew scriptures. Where, why are they not here? But the biggest surprise will be, oh, I'm here. <laughs> because that's God's grace. That's God's grace, amazing grace. And so we know that Boaz, because the reading says, married Ruth. Ruth is the next woman in our, our passage. Probably the most well-known lady in this particular passage. Uh, when you look at Ruth, she always seems to be, well, she always to, seems to come across as a really beautiful, faithful person. But she's got a really tragic life story. Famine kills all the men in her life. She's carrying an awful lot of grief and an awful lot of pain. Her husband is killed by the famine. Her father-in-law is also killed. Her brother-in-law is killed by the famine. So she flees to another land, to Israel, where she's an outsider. She's an immigrant. She's a Moabite. She doesn't really fit in to that particular culture or to that society at all. She's got so much going on inter internally. You could... Well, you would call her a minority in this day and age. She very much felt in the minority. She had had all sorts happen and she was different. But in this particular time, even though God had given strong instruction to Israel to look after the minorities, there was ingrained racism. And Ruth was subject to that racism. You could say she had... Uh, a very, very troubled past. So she was picked on, she was bullied, she was grieving, and she was in pain. Where Tamar was desperate and Ruth had a dodgy history, Ruth had pain. Ruth had pain. And then we'll come to the last person in this passage. In many versions, like I said, she's not even mentioned, she's just called Uriah's wife. And probably for good reason. In the New Living translation, she, she's actually named Bathsheba, but in many versions, she's just named Uriah's wife. Whether she was willing to sleep with King David is a question that we'll, we'll never find out, really. Probably, maybe, she felt that she had no choice. He was the king, so whatever the king wanted to do, he did. But he saw her from a distance bathing, he was overcome with lust for her, so he engineered for her husband to be killed on the front line of battle. And so this is where she finds herself, sleeping with the murderer of her own husband. That's a twisted up story. That's a lot to cope with in your own head. She's a widow. She's now sleeping with this, this murderer. He's forcing himself upon her. In that society, she would she would probably know, be known as that woman. That woman who's sort of like sleeping with our king. That's probably why she's not mentioned in this particular uh, passage in some versions. But really Bathsheba's life was a life of grief and pain. And we know also that her son that she bore really brought a lot of difficulty into her life and, and heartache. So Bathsheba's life was really riddled with all that stuff. 
And then if you read on in that passage, a bit of the passage that we've not read, we get down to another woman, a woman that we know well because we talk about her mostly every year around Christmas time, Mary. Until the visit of, of Gabriel, Mary could best be described as, well, faithfully insignificant. She was a good lady. She was a faithful lady, but she was insignificant. She was godly, but she was from a very insignificant background, a very ordinary village. Nobody really knew very much about her or even cared for her. And maybe after the visit of the angel to her husband-to-be, Joseph, well, maybe, maybe she was unfaithfully insignificant because all sorts of stuff was going through his head. How could this happen? You know, surely, surely this isn't God. Maybe this is another fella. But Joseph had a lot of thinking to do. There was turmoil in their relationship and it took a lot of, of working out. So five women mentioned in Matthew, carriers of pain, carriers of insecurity, carriers of a lot of history, not altogether good history. So what's, what's Matthew actually saying? What's Matthew saying through the seemingly pretty boring reading? Well, I believe that Matthew's actually saying this morning is God can use desperate people. God can use people with a, a dodgy history. God can use people from a culture and a society far different from the one that they find themselves in. God can use people who are wrecked with grief and pain. God can heal that and help you through that. And God can also use you if you feel that you're insignificant. God turns people carrying all this baggage and stuff that seems to weigh them down into carriers of hope, carriers of purpose, carriers of something that will change the world. We are carriers of hope this morning. Tamar, she maybe even didn't know it, but she was a carrier of hope. Rahab was a carrier of God's purpose. Ruth, and on and on these ladies, they were carriers of the lineage of the person that was going to change the world. They had all sorts of stuff going on in their lives. And yet God was using them. God was using them. Just like all the women in this particular passage, they prepared the way for Jesus. You and I are preparing the way for Jesus. Did you know that? We're preparing the way for Jesus in people's lives who God has blessed us with. God's blessed you with some pretty interesting people in your lives, hasn't he? Probably some of the people that you're thinking of now have a very messy life. Probably some of the people in your life right now are people who you would mm, rather not be in your life perhaps because it's a little bit traumatic and your life is not as comfortable as it could be with them in your life. But God's placed them in your life not to make your life hell but to make their life heaven. That's why you're there. They're there not to like make your life hell, but to them, for you to make their life heaven. Your carriers of hope, whether you're a mother, a father, a child, a neighbor or a colleague, you can be carriers of that, that hope. And personally, you might identify with some of this stuff this morning. You might have found yourself in a desperate situation, not knowing what to do, and maybe your choice at the time was not maybe the best choice. But God can still use you. Maybe you've got an awful lot of insecurities about you're not good enough or some of the stuff that's happened to you in your life restricts you from certain things. Don't let it restrict you. God can use that. You might have some dark, nasty sin in your life that haunts you. Listen, I've got some sins and I'm up here preaching. You know, God can use you. God can use you. God can forgive you of every sin. You might think you're insignificant and you'd never make anything. God can use you. When I was training to be a minister, I was up in the northeast of England and uh, I was in a church that couldn't afford to pay me. It was like, well, we're giving you experience. I'll go out and find a job. And uh, I worked in a dirty, dirty factory where when the guys in the factory found out I was a trainee minister, wow, what a gift. 
you know, I was the brunt of all their bullying and, and, and jokes. And some of the, I'm a bit of a practical joker myself, but some of the jokes I could take and they were quite funny, even though they were done to me. But some of the stuff was just downright awful. You know, the, uh, the charge hand, who was like the foreman's henchman, used to walk around with a football sock and a snooker ball in the bottom of it. And uh, he regularly, he was expert at getting you just on your shoulder or just on your elbow or on your kneecap or something like that. And like, you couldn't do anything about it. There was no unions or anything like that. And the management weren't bothered. But I got all kinds of sort of like terrible things happening to me. And I put up with him because my job was show them who Jesus is. Show them who Jesus is. And I tried to be super Christian for six months. And then an incident happened where I, I was nearly killed. I'll tell you the story another time. And um, my head just flipped. And the guy who actually nearly killed me, I ended up beating him with a wooden stick several times. So much so it gave all the factory chance to gather around and start chanting, kill him, kill him, kill him, because they didn't like him either. And you know, in those times, I don't know whether you've ever heard the audible voice of God, but I heard a voice that said, what are you doing? <laughs> you are going to lose your job. You're going to get arrested. You might as well say goodbye to the ministry, mate. You know, and you're going to have a criminal record. And uh, I threw this big stick down and said to this guy who was laying on the floor, who was about six foot five, he was enormous. <laughs> he was bigger than, about a foot bigger than me. I said, Mark, I'm so sorry. And he looked at me and he said, I deserved it. <laughs> and um, long story short, I tried to be super Christian up until that point. I came back after that weekend ready to receive P45. There's the door. See you later. And um, the Japanese boss said to me, are you okay now? And I apologized profusely to him. And he said, right, get on with your work. And throughout the coming weeks, these big fat northeastern lads who appeared drunk from the night before when they were still in work the next day, one by one, they would sidle up to me, make sure nobody else was listening, and they'd say, will you pray for me? Will you? So I had the privilege of praying for a, a, a lad who was going through real torrid time. He didn't want to get divorced from his wife. This charge hand with a snooker ball in the sock, he, he'd never told anybody he'd got a severely disabled son and it was really, really a, a tension between him and his wife because they were both exhausted. And he asked me to pray for him. And I'm thinking, you just hit me the other day. But it was a privilege. It was a privilege. And God gave opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to pray, to stand for him. The Japanese boss was so superstitious and a few accidents happened, he said to me, right, Andrew, you're a Christian. Next Wednesday, bring your Bible. Everybody's out in the car park. You're praying around the whole factory. And then we're going to have a, a barbecue outside with loads of alcohol. And all the guys went, yay. And, uh, and he gave me this opportunity to pray around the whole factory. He thought I was going to deliver some demons. I mean, I was, I was so desperate to walk around the factory going, ooh, <laughs> everything like that. But, I was ashamed. I went home that weekend crying my eyes out to God, saying, God, I have completely blown it, completely blown it. And yet God turned that round. God, God can take your shame and turn it into his fame if you just give it to him, if you just give it to him, no matter what you've done. You know, a Sunday school teacher asked the children one day, what do you have to do to be saved? And this little lad shot his hand up right at the back. And he said, sin. <laughs> and actually, it wasn't wrong. Because, you know, he was right. No one is too bad that they can't be saved. And no one is too good that they don't need saving. We've all sinned. We've all sinned. All those things may be something that you feel restrict you or exclude you. Tamar could have been excluded from that lineage. Rahab could have been excluded from that lineage. Ruth could have. Mary could have. But they weren't. They weren't because they were all carriers of hope. And maybe, maybe today you feel restricted. Excluded even. Maybe you feel God can't use you because of certain things about you. 
Let me tell you, let me encourage you this morning. God does use dodgy people. God uses very dodgy people. And it's awkward to read it sometimes in scripture and you wrestle with it. How can God use people like that? But God does use dodgy people. And you might be one of those dodgy people this morning. Let me ask you to bow your heads. I'll invite the musicians back up. Just reflect on your life as you are just closing your eyes right now. Just reflect. Not on what you've done or who you've been or what's happened to you or even who you are in your own eyes. Get a new vision of how God sees you today. When he sees you and he sees your heart, if you incline it towards him, he can use that. He can use you. You might be the shyest introvert in the whole place and yet God can use you. God can even use you as an evangelist. Because you have a way of just being sensitive to other people. If you have a very rocky past with lots of things that you've done but also may have been done to you and they seem to be dragging you down and holding you back, let me encourage you this morning. Jesus wants to set you free from all that because God can use you and he wants to use you. You are part of bringing hope and purpose to other people's lives. And maybe where you are right now, maybe this is a bit of a landmark moment for you. Where you're saying, do you know what? I'm encouraged that God uses these people. I'm encouraged that they're written down for, for all posterity I'm encouraged that they aren't cleaner than clean because that's me Father I pray Lord that you would speak your words of freedom by your Holy Spirit this morning to people who maybe for years have been locked up by tragedy and pain and grief and sin Lord, I pray that there be freedom this morning. Freedom from all that stuff. And Lord, that they would from this day walk in purpose and in freedom in your forgiveness. Let me encourage you. Maybe, the, maybe you've never committed your life to Jesus. Maybe you couldn't really honestly say that you were a follower of Jesus. Let me encourage you. It's the best thing that you could do. You don't have to get everything right first before you come to Jesus. You just have to say, I've done quite a lot of things wrong. <laughs> and Jesus will come into your life. He will transform your life. And he will make you or begin to start making you into the person he wants you to be. Trust him. You can trust him. You can trust him. I know in my own life, God forgives some pretty horrendous sins you can be forgiven today so let me encourage you if, you if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian this morning find a Christian who you like who you know talk to them allow them to pray with you commit your life to him thank you for listening